Anglo America. Take your backs to dollars, they don't carry ya. 7,000 miles away from home with language barriers. Land of opportunity, tell me, is it good to you? But six feet deep, I stole the land, is where they bury in November 1991. Papa came here with the wife, two daughters, the money, but they wanted them a better life. Peace to their name, so they piecing up the pain. Ain't no peace in the position, it's an immigrant that's praying. For a piece of the American empire for the king. To a piece of dream, they sold you, but it only was a dream. For a piece of mind to thinking that my mama could be seen. As an equal, not a foreign immigrant or in between. I was a kid in the sky, nothing but dreams in her eyes, hoping that we would survive. But mama, those were the times they telling us compromise. They always feed in the slice, made to believe I don't exist unless I wear a disguise. Cause I've been constantly lied to, broken down till I cry. Till I no longer recognize the person that was inside. Until we feel like the sun, and we forget where we're from. Though we still pay till it's done, and never question it once. So mama, tell me we want the person that I become. I have a soul for a tongue and the skin that shines. And listen and because the place that I'm from is still lingers deep on my tongue. So every word from my lungs can hold the weight of a ton if I'm ever stepping. I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm sinking, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm slipping, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm sinking, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. Yeah. Mama will make it in America. Mama will make it in America. Mama will make it in America. I swear. Hey. Mama will make it in America. Mama will make it in America. Yeah. Mama will make it in America. I swear. I swear. Homesick as we go, mama's never really home Cause she working all alone, living broke, we need a loan Papa threatened mama's life, papa left with no goodbye Promise to myself this I know Mel will ever make me cry Now I'm thinking that I'm grown, all I wanna do is roam Running far away from home, in the crowd I feel alone Mama, she be working late, lots of showing on her face Too much pressure on her plate, I'm too selfish to relate Auntie says stay in your home, might get darker cause you prone Look into the mirror, oh, Filipino blood and bones Questioning my skin and tone like I should be embarrassed Though, whiter skin is seen as gold This is what we're always told Mama said to learn the way Every day I emulate Till identity erased Overcome by inner hate Teacher said to hide my tongue They don't understand me none Hold my breath These foreign lungs too powerful They lack a gun I'm correcting mama's words I'm embarrassed when she's thirst What makes me better than her This anguish was her first Ruby can you get a grip Find a balance to my slip Mom and daughter need you quick Stop thinking that you the shit 7,000 miles from home But a million more to go Gotta make it on my own I I can feel I'm getting close, 7,000 miles from home, but a million more to go, gotta make it on my own, I can feel I'm getting close. Mama will make it in America, Mama will make it in America, yeah, Mama will make it in America, I swear, yeah, yeah, Mama will make it in America, Mama will make it in America, yeah, Mama will make it in America, I swear, yeah. Mama will make it in America. Hey, Mama will make it in America. Hey, Mama will make it in America. I swear, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mama will make it in America. Hey, Mama will make it in America. Hey, Mama, I made it in America. Hello, I'm Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History of your Smithsonian Institution. I'm so honored to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Dr. Theo Gonzalez, the Interim Director of the Smithsonian's Asian Pacific American Center. Theo and I both join you from Washington, DC, and thus we give our gratitude and honor to the Piscataway peoples and their descendants. Wherever you are, let us come together to acknowledge the precedence of Native peoples and what an honor it is to live and work on their territories. We stand together in the face of 
an anti-Asian violence that has wrecked the country to celebrate and uplift the long history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Together with organizations across the country, we work to tell the complicated and nuanced history of the United States. A history filled with examples of discrimination and inequity, but also of resilience, solidarity, justice, and hope. We do this work thanks to the support and advocacy of those who've come before us, such as um, Norman Mineta, former transportation secretary, who with Republicans Alan Simpson and Pete Wilson introduced the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, signed into law by President Ronald Reagan, that granted reparations to incarcerated Americans of Japanese descent and were sustained by current leaders like Representative Doris Matsui, a Smithsonian regent. And of course, we've witnessed together not only the election of the first woman vice president in Kamala Harris, but she of Asian and African American descent. Our community's experiences are woven into the fabric of this country. Tonight, we will hear from scholars, artists, and activists who will share powerful stories and amazing artifacts that demonstrate the diversity of Asian American history. The Smithsonian has been working for decades to collect and reflect on these stories, not only to preserve for future generations, but to help us better understand each other in these times. At the conclusion of this program, make sure to visit smithsonianapa.org stand, where you will find over 260 resources from across the Smithsonian's museums and research centers. Please use the materials to start conversations in classrooms or with your coworkers. There are also activities that you can do at home with family and with friends. Today, we may be celebrating Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, but our work continues all year long. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And now we'll hear from Joanne Jenkins, who is the CEO of AARP, the organization that helped to make this program possible. AARP is honored to be partnering with the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center to remind everyone that Asian Pacific American history is American history. Ever since May was officially designated as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in 1992, Americans of all backgrounds have paid tribute to the generations of Asian and Pacific Islanders who have enriched America's history and are instrumental in its future success. But this year, it takes on an added significance. As COVID-19 spread throughout our country, so did horrific attacks against Asian Americans, especially the elders. The AAPI community not only faced danger from the coronavirus, they also faced increased violence and harassment fueled by prejudice, hatred, and xenophobia. While these attacks have increased dramatically over the past year, we know they have been a part of our history for more than a century but the coronavirus brought them to the forefront and helped bring about a new urgency to address them. One of my favorite quotes often attributed to Gandhi is, be the change you wish to see in the world. And that's what we're trying to do at AARP. As an organization representing 38 million Americans and their families, we're using our extensive communication channels, program resources, and nationwide community presence to condemn all racially motivated violence and harassment, and to work towards bringing the country together. We joined with the Association of National Advertisers Alliance for Inclusive and Multicultural Marketing, along with 88 other brands to take a stand against hate and violence targeting the AAPI community. We believe that if we want to reunite the United States of America, we must all learn about, understand, and appreciate our shared history as Americans. That means we need to be learning, celebrating, and honoring Asian Pacific Americans 12 months a year, not just one month a year. Joanne Jenkins, thank you so much for your welcoming remarks, and we definitely appreciate your support as we begin our first conversation, and an important one, here for the Smithsonian's gathering for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And we've got some very smart faces here with us 
uh, today. We have Professor Erica Lee, Regents Professor of History and Asian American Studies at the University of Minnesota. We've got Lisa Sasaki, Interim Director, Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Professor Duncan Ryukin Williams, Professor of Religion and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Good to see you too, Professor. So glad to join you. Well, let me start with the first question. This panel is themed around you are Americans. And, And the reason why is because, as you know, there's the very dynamic, which is, are you American? And so let me ask you this. Why is it that with an Asian American Pacific Islander history that is two centuries long of contributions and loving contributions to this country of history in the United States, why is it that APIs or Asian American Pacific Islanders are both explicitly and incipitly treated as not being from here? Uh, Erica, can you start for us? Yeah, absolutely. And and it really is quite uh, amazing that in 2021, we have to have a program um, that explicitly says and reminds people, yes, we are American. Uh, You know, Asian Americans have had to say this continuously um, for 200 years uh, during World War II, when there's that very famous... um, sign that Japanese Americans uh, put on their their businesses after Executive Order 9066, I am American. After 9-11, when South Asian Americans also had to literally wrap themselves in the flag in order to protect themselves from from violence and racial profiling and in order to assert their Americanness. And the reason why is simple. It's because of American racism, American racism that pre-existed before mass migration from Asia. Uh, So literally Asian immigrants could not become US citizens by virtue of the 1790 Naturalization Act. Uh, We were likened to be more similar to African-Americans and American Indians than European immigrants. We were expelled, we were uh, excluded, we were arrested and detained, we were incarcerated. Um, so it's this, the, it's this history that is um, really coming to, to the fore right now, where again, after 200 years of history, Asian Americans are both hyper visible in relationship to um, you know, more lawmakers, more journalists, more academics, more sports uh, um, stars, and actors than ever before, but also um, continued to be racialized as as foreigners. Lisa, build on that. I just wanted to to say that this idea of being the perpetual other, that no matter how long your history is in the the United States, I'm a fourth generation Japanese American, um, which, you know, my great grandfather worked on the railroads, owned a noodle shop in in Utah, um, had a farm in Sacramento, all of which he lost um, during World War II when he was um, unfairly and unjustly arrested by the FBI because he was considered a leader in the community and therefore a suspect um, when Pearl Harbor happened. And after that, you know, my my grandmother um, in particular, who was an American citizen, had this moment where she was placed um, into a camp where she couldn't leave, where she didn't have um, you know, the same rights as other American citizens and how much that that affects you throughout your life. Uh, one of the most defining moments that I've ever had with her was this moment when she sat me down because she had just received this letter from President Reagan that actually um, apologized for the actions that were taken during World War II, thanks to the Civil Liberties Acts Act. And she um, had never wanted to talk about her experience in camp, but she wanted me to understand how important this letter was because for the first time ever, her government apologized to her and said what they did was wrong. Um, And this is just one story out of 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of stories of, of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who are American citizens, but consistently are considered foreigners within their own land. And I, I completely agree with what Erica said. This has been systematic through history. And we've seen that through policies, through legislations, through individual actions that have all led us up to this moment today where we are yet again stating um, that we are American. Duncan, in your research, what stands out in this dynamic that both Erica and Lisa have uh, opened us up with? I became a U.S. citizen just last year. Uh, I gave up my Japanese uh, nationality after 33 years of being in this country on different uh, visas and so forth. But uh, in the, uh, my own research and also my work as a Buddhist priest uh, at a temple here in Los Angeles in Little Tokyo, uh, I've come to learn what it means as a new American to inherit the histories of you know, many, many generations of Asian Americans before me. And I think in studying that history, we come, I've come to learn that there's two def different visions of what is America. One vision is a vision out of singularity. It says America is essentially or foundationally a white and Christian nation. And then there's a different vision, one of multiplicity. Uh, one that says we are a multi-ethnic nation that uh, uh, is composed of many different peoples and many different faiths. And you know, we have religious freedom as the kind of core tenant of, and, and that implies religious pluralism as well, not singularity. And so that's what I've come to kind of notice over time is that uh, we, those two visions of America have very early kind of like uh, uh, Dyna dynamic uh, conversation with each other, and that we still in 2021 still have that uh, conversation. I think you saw in the January 6, uh, you know, uh, what happened in Washington DC as one expression of how there's a certain kind of vision of America that is very singular. And then there's, I think others who have over history, you know, uh, suggested a different way to see America. Part of some of the great rights and privileges uh, we all have as Americans, both implied as well uh, as implicit, is the ability to be vocal. And uh, our communities, unfortunately, do not, in many cases, not all, uh, value uh, vocal as good. Uh, but as we live through this history today, um, and as a journalist that I am, and as I've reported on the, those who take on the rights of pri and privileges of being American, and the, uh, the implied and as well implicit, which is to march, which is to go out and let your voice be heard in groups. And in fact, uh, there will be an artifact brought into the collection uh, that is from today, the present. Uh, the first we, major march during this last year of the pandemic and the unfortunate use of language and sentiment that was against those of Asian descent here in the United States. And, and this banner uh, was held during a march in San Francisco by community members. And it, we went out to go take a look at it before it is officially taken into the collection, the, the beginning of its journey, if you will, uh, to make it to Washington, DC. And this is what we found in San Francisco Chinatown. This is the banner that we created for the first anti-racism demonstration that we conducted on February 29, 2020. It was even before March, before the lockdown, before we knew how serious it was. My name is Julie Tang, and I am a retired judge of the San Francisco Superior Court. When China locked down on January 22nd, I was starting to get worried because I knew that there might be repercussions here in America uh, for Chinese Americans. Also, the Chinatown community was suffering a sudden drop in business, 70% reduction. The tourists were shunning Chinatown. Mm -hmm. My name is Ding Bong Li. Well, I'm presiding president for 
Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. He was of the same mind as, as me, and we both felt very strongly something had to be done. More than 30, 15, more than, just yeah. around here, mm -hmm. we have a discussion about how to plan for the rally. They all came and showed up, and we marched together and to Union Square. This movement is really across the board, across races. It's a human rights issues, it's a civil rights issues. This is the first large demonstration called by the Chinese American community to target the issue of racism during the pandemic. This is the first, fight the virus and not the people. This actually come from a lot of the children who are being bullied in school. Kids would come up and say, you're the virus. We unite together to support our businesses. Fan Casey oppose racism. Support the global effort to fight the virus. Gayao, unite and fight. The three themes are, we want business to come back to Chinatown. We don't want to lose our San Francisco Chinatown. We wanted to be a part of this global effort to fight the virus, to combat the pandemic. And just as importantly, when fighting the virus, don't fight us. Every day when we open up the newspapers, there's always one or two or three incidents of hate crime beatings. And this one in this Chinese newspaper, that's today's. The first article is about a young Asian man with a baby in tow, and he got pushed down and beat up. And in the basketball court, now a young man was pushed down by these guys and beat up, and he's now suffering a coma. And in here, the third one is two Asian women was actually cut up with a weapon in San Francisco yesterday, yesterday uh, on Stockton Street, right outside. So this is, we, we are traumatized every day when we read these articles, every day. And every, looking at this, I said, is it gonna be my turn next? I have lived in this country for at least 60 years. I don't know another time where I feel that my life is so much in danger and the community around me is in danger. So it is a moment in time that we have to reckon with. And what we go through will be suffered by another community at some point. We already know this, how the Muslims suffered after 9-11, the Mexicans over immigration issues, and the Chinese going back to 1882. And I see the community that is embedded in history in this institution here, representing all the struggles of the Chinese community, starting with 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, when Chinese were not allowed to venture outside of Chinatown. All the big issues regarding the Chinatown, we always sit here to discussion and decide what to do. We have about more than 8,000 lawsuits against the federal government, local governments, all for the unfairness and justice. All these f struggles were experienced by people who built this organization from the ground and carried it and kept it for 175 years. We Americans, we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. No one will tell us to go back to China or this is not your country or you don't belong. We are here to stay. Stop Asian hate. The banner Asian. contains our heart and our soul and our vision for what America should be. The Smithsonian is a national museum. It talks about American history. Chinese Americans is a part of the fabric of American society. And I hope that that banner will have its rightful place at the Smithsonian permanently as a part of the history that will be here to stay. How about that, huh? Um, Lisa, I want to start with you uh, because of it is going to now become part of your collection as you as a representative and employee of the Smithsonian. Tell us about what was happening there. I think what you see is our definition of American history expanding. Oftentimes when we walk through museums, when we go through um, the Smithsonian, if you're, if you're here in Washington, DC, you have the opportunity to see uh, physically in front of you 
all of the objects that make up our history. And, and sadly, over time, oftentimes Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have been absent from that narrative because we don't have the objects to, to tell the stories. We often don't have the stories recorded. Um, you know, that that really make up um, all of the day to day activities, the, the contributions for generations that have happened across all of these communities. And so what that banner represents to the Smithsonian and also to me is that opportunity to tell that story and to make sure that future generations can look back and see the amazing efforts that the community made to declare itself American during a time of crisis. And so it's such an honor to be able to have that come into our collections for future generations to see. I am looking forward to it, Lisa. So thank you. Uh, and I know it's a large group of, and a big team that gets this stuff to happen. And Erica, as I move to you really quickly on this, uh, the one thing that uh, Judge Julie was telling us was that table, as well as Ding was telling us, which has been there literally and figuratively in that location in the building of over 170 years, saw the discussion after 1882, saw the discussion during uh, later on in history, during the American internment, saw the discussion later during 1982 for Vincent Chin. It, had, it has had all the discussions that have affected the AAPI community. That is so humbling. And now in 2020, they gathered again. That's right. You know, one of the wonderful things about that video is that first of all, I think many of us have seen that banner in many photographs and in stories. Um, and I just included it in a, in a new chapter on Asian American activism during the pandemic, but to see its roots in the CCBA building and to hear um, the, the originators um, of this current day movement speak about it was, was really inspirational. And you know, the most important thread that I think um, that connects that history in that room to what we're talking about today is the generations of activism. You know, I'm hearing a lot um, and a lot of celebration about Asian Americans. It's time to wake up. It's time to make our voices heard. Um, and I, I applaud that. And I, I am part of that, you know, amplification. But I also want to shout loudly um, to remind everybody that we have been fighting, you know, as Judge Julie said, we have been fighting for generations. And it's extremely notable that the CCBA, which was one of the you know, most uh, vocal and organized uh, opponents to Chinese exclusion and to the decades of anti-Chinese laws in San Francisco and in the West, even before 1882, that they are again leading the movement and are part of a newer movement. That is that is our history that has been lost, that not only have we been here for a long time, but we also have been fighting a long time. Um, and I, I just so appreciate the journey that this um, banner will be making across the country to the Smithsonian. Yeah, Duncan building on what both Lisa and Erica said. I, you know, I, I was a Chinatown kid. I walked by that building. I can't tell you how many different times. I never really peeked inside. But to know that that history is right there in front of me, but I didn't access it. I was a little bit embarrassed, um, but I was also glad that I at least know now. And one of the questions that comes up, seeing that history of the discussion at that table for the last two centuries, was do those sorts of actions help us to heal from the violence? Does it help us heal from what we're going through right now? Yeah, I very much think so, um, because I, as, uh, Erica nicely put it, you know, it's, it's about these ancestors of ours uh, who uh, not only have carried potentially different kinds of, you know, racialized trauma of those various kinds of exclusions, but also provide us with models and examples of, 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 of hope and persistence. Um, you know, because I'm a scholar of Asian American Buddhism in particular, I, I recall like one of the most important banners I saw was from the 1920 
Oahu uh, sugar plantation strikes where the Young Buddhist Association, the YBA of Honolulu led a 4,000 person march uh, through the streets of Honolulu asking for equal pay uh, in a system of, 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 of wages that was racially uh, uh, kind of disparate. And that they were asking for Asian Americans to be given the equal pay as, as, as white workers. Uh, and they, the, the Young Buddhist Association carried this banner with a large portrait of Abraham Lincoln on it. And uh, that was their way, I think, of claiming we belong here, we're American too. And I think, uh, as Eric was saying, that, that, is, that is a history to be recalled and sometimes you know, forgotten, if not for places like the Smithsonian. Well, Lisa, that's the perfect segue. I dunk on you, don't take my job away from me, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, uh, talking about the Smithsonian, and, and I'm really interested in this. What's the approach you think we need to do for the next 10 or 100 years? Yeah, we have to recognize that um, our stories are important and are worthy of collection, first of all, first and foremost. You know, so many times when I've talked to community members, they seem um, shocked and, and almost in awe uh, that any museum, let alone the Smithsonian, would be willing to come and to collect their stories. And, and that shouldn't be a surprise. Um, it should be a part of, of what we speak about and what we learn about. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the goal has always been, the mission has always been to ensure that the Smithsonian tells these stories. And it's never more important than it is right now. We couldn't be more appreciative of the partnership with the National Museum of American History to ensure that that happens. And we do that through curators who are uh, focused specifically on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. We ensure that by collecting um, objects to make sure that we can do displays and have um, events and programs that talk about that talks about this just like this right now is happening. We also have to make sure that this gets into our schools um, and that also parents teach their children about this. And I'll have to admit that for my family, oftentimes these stories weren't talked about until I was much older and I could ask. Um, and so I think some of this just starts at the home where you can ask your parents, your grandparents, your aunties, your uncles um, about their experience and, and get that um, history, those stories before they're lost forever. Yes, do it at home, be a mini Smithsonian. Hold tight those things that represent that journey that Lisa's talking about. You know, I've got one that I hold tight and I, I bring it forward as often as I can. It's a flyer that my grandfather got at the Long Beach shipyards during World War II because he was a sheet metal worker and he would point to it every time I was a kid going to visit him. It was on the wall and it was just a simple flyer because every time they finished 200 Liberty ships, they would give out a flyer to all the sheet metal workers and say 200 ships for Liberty. And he took it not as a flyer, but as a badge of honor. And he actually typed out the date, June 1943, put a piece of actual scotch tape, tape that onto the bottom right-hand corner, put it on a frame, and every year when I'd go visit him, he'd point to that. He took my mom there when he, when she was just, oh, this high. And he would say, see these big round pieces of metal? It's the only gun on the Liberty ship I built it. I'm now in America. I'm fighting for this country. We, we must win World War II. This guy never forgot it. So when he passed, my mom was there cleaning up. And I said, I want that. We all have these artifacts. You have your own mini Smithsonian. I love the Smithsonian for this reason. I'm going on and on. Lisa, quickly, the Smithsonian in the last year has been working like the Dickens, as they say, to refresh what's out there. Um, what might we see? Well, I think throughout uh, today, you're going to be hearing more about that um, as you, you watch the rest of this program. So I'm not going to spoil anything. Okay. 
But I will say this, if you go to uh, smithsonianapa.org slash stand, there are over 260 resources that are available to the public from across the 19 museums and nine research centers of the Smithsonian, all focused on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Um, and so I really would encourage you to go and take a look at all the wealth uh, of resources, materials, curricula, um, other objects uh, that you can learn about for free uh, on the website. Doggone it, Lisa. You know, that's not my segment, but I wanted to know. So you all have to <laughs> stick around because it, she's right. You're going to get a little bit of a sneak peek. So, so, so do stick around. Uh, Erica, uh, as we think about this, and, and, and please reflect on what Lisa was saying earlier too, but you, you did mention action. So as we try to bring this to action, what can we do to bring home that idea of you are American? Well, I think we need to reflect on uh, the many different ways that we can be American. We can be American by uh, continuing to assert that identity if, if that is what the times call for. We can do it in terms of um, replenishing the knowledge of our own family's history and our community's histories. And we can do it by joining in the marches and the movements for racial justice. I do note that you know on the day that we're we're having this discussion, um, prosecutors in Georgia have decided to charge the uh, killer in the Atlanta spa shootings with a hate crime um, and uh, using Georgia's uh, law that was passed in the wake of the killing of Ahmed Aubrey. And so one of the lessons of how Asian Americans become American is, by becoming involved in those same struggles for racial justice with the understanding that racial justice for one group is racial justice for us all. You know, I would just echo that, uh, you know, we just held uh, here in Los Angeles at a Buddhist temple, uh, the 49th day, Buddhist, we believe that uh, on the 49th day after somebody passed away, it's a moment of transition to another realm. And also for those left behind, a moment of, of transformation too. And so we held a ceremony with Asian American Buddhist leaders uh, from many different lineages to honor uh, those who passed away in Atlanta. Uh, we specifically named uh, uh, young, uh, AU, who, who's a uh, you know, Korean uh, individual, a very devout Buddhist, and uh, married into a family of you know, African-American and Korean heritage, and her sons just remember her as somebody who fought for uh, you know, dignity and, 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 and uh, against discrimination. And so we were remembering her, and as we were remembering her, we were remembering you know, back in January, we had unfortunate incident in San Francisco. We mentioned assaults and uh, violences in the film earlier, but uh, a senseless assault that led to the death of Vicha Ratanapakti, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, we saw, I think, security camera footage of him taking a daily walk and then being pushed and then uh, passing away. And, and the Thai Buddhist community in San Francisco rallied around the family. And I think all those things, you know, we held it at our temple here in Little Tokyo that was vandalized uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, so I think we have to recall these type of things and go all the way back. Uh, and, you know, some people are political activists and can do the marches and rallies. I think as Buddhists, we wanted to have a ceremony of healing and thinking about how do we take on all of those hurts that have come down through generations and find a way, a Buddhist way to, to, to respond to hatred with loving kindness. And Lisa. I, I would agree with all of that. And I think that at, at the heart of this um, in our democracy as Americans, we participate. Um, and so all of these ways of participating, but I think um, what we recognize as well is voting um, and making sure that our, our votes are counted and are heard in that very, very American act uh, of going in and electing our officials um, in order to have fair representation. Well, you know, I love this conversation and with such good hearts, uh, Lisa and Duncan and Erica, and I'm actually speaking to you from Atlanta. And when I think of action, uh, I think of not only looking back, but uh, also to find more in these stories. And I'm here to 
look at the eight victims, six of which were of Asian descent. I was just in Young AU's house um, about three hours ago and speaking with her son, Bobby Peterson, who represents in an unfortunate storm, uh, a great ray of light. He is speaking out and he's bringing communities together. So I think we really have the opportunity, in, especially in the, the, the spirit of the Smithsonian, to hold these stories tight because they show us about our future. Two months on from that horrible catastrophe is that what did their lives teach us about being here in America? And there's so much. And so that's the opportunity, I think, when we think of you are in America. I'm getting all misty eyed here. Uh, so for all of you, uh, tell me why we are American. Duncan, you go first. We are American because we enact the principles in the constitution, due process, equality under law, religious freedoms. They're not real unless we actually embody and enact them in our own lives. And that's what I think makes us American. Erica. We are American because the Asian American experience has represented both the promise of America, but also where it has fallen short. Beautiful, Lisa. We are American because we believe as has our parents and our grandparents and many generations to come that we can be that dream uh, that was held up uh, at the founding of this country in order to be a more perfect union um, and to have equality for all men and women alike. Poets, 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 and they don't even know it. Thanks for bringing your hearts today to talk about a very important topic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, up next, what we have for you is an introduction to the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center's new educational webinar series, We Are Not a Stereotype. Take a listen. Thank you for watching this introduction to We Are Not a Stereotype, Breaking Down Asian Pacific American Bias. A new video series the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center is launching in partnership with educators across the United States and Hawaii. My name is Andrea Kim Neighbors, and I'm the Manager of Education Initiatives at the Smithsonian's Asian Pacific American Center, and I'm so happy that you have joined us. And during these next few minutes, I'll be introducing what the series is and why we're doing this series this year. I want to begin this introduction with a land acknowledgement, recognizing the Piscataway people, past and present, as the original stewards of the area commonly known as Washington, D.C., where the Smithsonian is located. We thank the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center in Santa Rosa, California, for allowing us to share this statement on why we should include land acknowledgements. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with Native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the Indigenous peoples whose land we are located. We honor and are grateful for the land we occupy and recognize the ongoing damage of colonialism. Land acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to, to dismantle the ongoing legacies of colonialism and the pursuit of truth and healing. At the Smithsonian APA Center, we believe that education is a critical means of unlearning racist, patriarchal, and colonialist paradigms that have led to systemic racism. As we develop the series in the summer of 2020, we must also recognize that Asian Pacific Americans must confront anti-Blackness and stand against the unjust treatment of Black people throughout the United States and the world. The center recognizes that our current efforts to amplify and uplift Asian Pacific American communities today and throughout history is made possible because of Black-led activism. We believe that education plays a role in uplifting and validating lived experiences and shared histories that reflect how we have been divided and united over time. Throughout this video series, you will gain access to a number of talks about Asian Pacific American histories, videos that model classroom strategies about these histories, and more, all created by educators for educators. While tackling Asian Pacific American stereotypes and biases, these histories will also feature stories of intersection and solidarity across different communities, leading to a deeper and more complex understanding of what it means to be an American. 
Each video will be accompanied by a digital collection through the Smithsonian's Learning Lab, an interactive website that utilizes digital images, videos, text, and so much more. You can find all of these resources that I've just mentioned on a new page on our website at smithsonianapa.org backslash learn backslash not a stereotype. And we hope that you will check back often for new content and updates. With the launch of this series and complementary resources, we only begin to scratch the surface of long and complex Asian Pacific American histories and narratives that are often missing from classroom textbooks, literature, teaching tools, and more. While there will be topics, themes, and questions that will be missing from this first series, this is just the beginning. There will be more opportunities for us to learn together in the future. We have more work to do, and we are thrilled that you are on this journey with us. I wrote this album because I want my life to change. Tired of being shortchanged, I'm trying to remain sane. Hopped off the plane, didn't stop all the pain. My father's still in debt and we've been struggling to pay For a bedroom up on Meeklin Ave Reaching for just meat and half Hands tied against the odds How you gonna even that? People from the slums once Now live in the hum drum Mama from the bottom So we dream what we can stunt once Mama, I know it's gonna be five or wherever we go Cause we know your race is gonna dream and be a hero What's an ego to an eagle? I free flow when I speak though My pet dreams to people My skin's so full of pino Oftentimes my pride inside is in high tides, they rebuke the ocean was the day you learn to know stop. Closed eyes, fingerprint ink with the most die. Those tops, mama never blink, say the oath twice. I said, mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, mama, we gon' make it there someday. I said, mama, we gon' make it here. Yeah, I said, mama, we gon' make it here. Uh, I said, mama, we gon' make it here Yes, I said, mama, we gon' make it here And we gon' make it this day I feel the sun's rays open up my eyes I feel brave cause I once made a promise to myself That I'm a vessel, so it's one way That I'ma take up space until I'm done Let the song play, my friends say unpaid These days be the worst days We pray, they lay more cases at a worse rate Help us find a way, we rise up Carry this weight, frontliners lead the way And we thank you for the risks made Worst case, fixed ways, fixed wage, missed days But this case, fist race, not Logan City Birthplace, circa 91 Cause we immigrants in this place Gentrified, this place Stayed alive in this race Took a plane, this way Across the ocean, this wave Settled in the bay So I hit him with the this face Grew up in a way that I knew myself I can't wait for another day to rise up We'll make it someday Thank you, Ruby, for sharing your voice with us in that beautiful performance. Aloha, y'all. My name is Erica Moritsugu, and I serve as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Senior Liaison at the White House. I come to this new position at a time of persistent anti-Asian hate and violence and during a pandemic that has taken a severe economic and personal toll on our AAN and HPI communities but we have the confidence of a president and a vice president who see us and hear us and value us. And they're committed to providing us with the safety and opportunity that we should expect and can now hope for. This is evidenced through their actions since their first week in office and through their all of government approach in addressing the rise of anti-Asian hate every day since then. 
My first public appearance on behalf of the White House last month was on the sad occasion um, of a vigil to honor the victims of the mass shooting in, in Indianapolis in the Sikh community. It was a solemn reminder that the attacks on ethnic and religious minorities in the AA and NHPI communities is not new. In fact, it is as old as our country and our annexation to it or our arrival to it. At the vigil, we heard from the beloved granddaughter of a victim at the FedEx facility. That night, we also heard from the brother of Balbir Singh Saudi, who was shot to death in Mesa, Arizona in 2001 in one of the first acts of retaliation targeting Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians days after the Twin Tower attacks on September 11th. Mr. Saudi's turban, which has been donated to the Smithsonian, is now on display in the White House residence as a part of an exhibit commemorating Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This is how important it is that we not forget and that one of the ways we can remember is through the collection of the National Museum of American History. This program, We Are American and We Stand Together, brings the stories and insights of the nation's preeminent scholars and activists, together with the treasures from the Smithsonian, to engage a broad audience in a deeper exploration of the past, present, and future of Asians in America. Although the community has had a difficult year of pain and fear, it's also important to take the time to recognize that Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders across our nation have a long history of achievement and perseverance. I hope we can embrace the noble examples of leadership, resilience, and allyship shown by our AAN and HPI communities and recommit to the work that needs to be done to ensure safety, justice, equity, and opportunity for all communities. Mahalo Nui Loa for the opportunity to join you today. And now I'd like to introduce Wade Henderson from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Thank you, Erica, and greetings, everyone. I'm Wade Henderson, Interim President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. The story of, of the civil rights movement is one of diverse communities coming together with a common purpose justice for all. And for the Leadership Conference Coalition in particular, central to that story is the deep legacy of the AAPI community's activism and allyship. For example, the Japanese American Citizens League served as one of our founding members back in 1950. And that was just a few years after the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Their decision to link arms with other civil rights groups spoke volumes about their determination to emerge from tragedy as a force for social change. Now, fast forward to many years later, when I was a young attorney for the ACLU and had the opportunity to help push for the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. The bill granted reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interned during the war. Because the Japanese American community led the effort so skillfully and was willing to engage in personal lobbying and advocacy, they successfully got the bill through. That victory was an extraordinary breakthrough, both for the Japanese American community and for civil rights. It validated the old common law principle that for every wrong, there is a remedy, a remedy that must be pursued through collective action. Now I've come full circle. I'm using the lessons I learned from that experience to drive efforts to provide a reparation study on behalf of African Americans today. And I'm pleased to report that the Japanese American Citizens League and organizations across the AAPI community are supporting this work. This shared and reciprocal respect for equity, the rule of law and our common humanity reminds us just how much change we can affect when we unite across communities. And now I'd like to introduce Angie Goff, who will be moderating tonight's second panel, Stand Together. 
Thanks so much, Wade. Well, we are just thrilled to continue this very important conversation today as we talk about ways that we all can stand together. And for this, we have some very important voices joining us, some esteemed voices. Uh, I would love to introduce our panel, Sam Vong, who is the curator of the Asian Pacific American History at the Smithsonian's American History Museum, working on a lot of promising projects to help our AAPI community. We also have Theo Gonzalez, who is the Interim Director of Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, and David Inoue, Executive Director of Japanese American Citizens League. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you. I want to begin with you, Theo. Looking back, what do you think today's movement and what you've seen and how we've been able to rally and this momentum that we are seeing, how does that compare to other civil rights movements that we've seen in the past? That's a great question, Angie. I think what is consistent between what's happening now and what is happening in the, what happened in the past is that this is really part of a long tradition of what Asian America is about. Uh, the whole premise behind the idea of Asian America is people coming together, standing up for each other. Uh, oftentimes in Asian American history, what you'll find are separate ethnic groups striking out on their own, um, making claims for themselves uh, in, in their own ethnic uh, communities. Um, but over time, what, you, what you'll see in Asian American history, and this is going all the way back to the 1800s, as far back as 1875 with the Page Act, uh, all those exclusion laws of 1882 and 1924 and 1934, right up through internment and um, and and, um, and in 1975, with the settlement of refugee communities, uh, what you'll find is people standing up for each other, um, sp standing up on each other's behalf. Uh, and so it's it is a realization that these ethnic groups are not alone; that there's also strength in numbers. But it's more than just a coalition. It's also it also represents a real tradition of people coming together. So we'll see that again and again. And as as much as there is. Um, um, you know, the, the misery and the pain of having to suffer from these attacks, again, time after time. The other part of the tradition is people standing up for each other and with each other. Yeah, but I have to be honest with you, and maybe as someone who is half Asian, half Korean, who spent most of my childhood in South Korea, um, and then moving all over the country after that, I, I do have to, to raise the question, the fact that that we are having this issue of people feeling invisible, we are having this issue of our colleagues and our friends saying that it's difficult for them to see that this kind of racism actually exists. Um, history plays a part in it. Do you think it's because people don't know enough about this history? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't think there's a lot of knowledge about um, Asian American history and this longer history of uh, anti-Asian violence and discrimination. And I think one of the things that curators like Theo and myself um, and educators um, across the country can do is to provide um, the kind of tools and resources to learn more about this history. Um, we, we do have to focus on this idea that um, this is part of American history and America's past. Mm. Okay. Well, um, I think that at this point, we want to throw it over to our friend Richard Louie. Um, many of us know him, an outstanding journalist and really um, one of our, our big voices in the AAPI community. And I know that he had an opportunity to go behind the scenes there at the Smithsonian and look at some of these artifacts that tell the story of this long going fight, this decades, decades long going fight um, against this type of hate. My name is Sam Vong. I'm a curator of Asian Pacific American History at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. So what we have here is a really interesting agricultural tool, specially designed for cutting asparagus. It was donated by Anita Bautista to tell the history of Filipino migrants who worked in asparagus farms in California. In the 1920s to 1940s, Asparagus uh, growers were recruiting Mexican and Filipino migrants to work on the farms. As you can see, this is a wooden handle. At the end, you see a very sharp blade. And the way they use it is they grab the handle, they would cut, pick it, and they move along, and it's a long lines of um, asparagus. 
did this for eight to 10 hours a day, 15 cents an hour. By 1930, there were approximately 18,000 Filipinos working in California's agricultural industry. So this is a backpack from the U.S. Army, and it was repurposed by a gentleman named Mr. Hardiv Singh Shergill. Mr. Shergill graduated from the University of Punjab in 1960, and shortly after, he was recruited by a PhD department in geography at the University of Washington, Seattle. And his parents gave him $15, and he hitchhiked across Europe. It was on his back for 6,800 miles, and then he scored a free ride on uh, a freighter uh, across the Atlantic. So this part of the backpack is kind of interesting. This is where Mr. Shergill said he kept his turban, or extra turban, um, because he's a follower of the Sikh faith. I kind of see it as uh, a transitional object that tells a story about the changing attitudes towards Asian immigrants. For many decades, Asian immigrants were seen as undesirable. By the 1960s, by the time you, uh, Mr. Shilgal makes his migration, they begin to see Asian immigrants as valuable assets. They had certain expertise, certain skills, um, so a lot of scientists, for example. He gifted it to the Smithsonian with the idea that this is a very precious and personal object in his life that represents part of this longer history of Sikh migration to the U.S. This poster was made in 1973, and it was used for a community health fair in New York City's Chinatown. It says, unite to fight for our rights, Chinatown Street Fair. And it says what the fair was focusing on was health, education, housing, legal education, support for the elderly. This is a moment at the height of Asian American activism community activists, uh, most of whom were college students, influenced by the civil rights movement, were concerned that there was a lack of access to adequate health care in the community. The health clinic that they created eventually became a federally qualified community health center. Um, and there are chapters across New York City to, to this day. My work at the museum focuses on bringing greater visibility to Asian American and Pacific Islander histories. And we work with communities to tell their stories at the museum and to show how integral they have been to American society. Hi, I'm Anthea Hartig, the Elizabeth McMillan Director of the National Museum of American History of the Smithsonian Institution. So we're looking at a chest made in China for export that belonged to George Washington. He purportedly liked at least three to four cups of strong Chinese tea every morning for his breakfast. And we're really incredibly fortunate to have this from the late 1700s. These are kind of stereotypical scenes of what English men and women might want to see in their perceptions of what China might be like. The kind of exoticism that still, you know, sadly permeates a lot of our understanding of, uh, of Asian cultures was in full force. So this was a very prized object and it's in our American Enterprise exhibition and for me really shows the global power of trade, of expansion, you have the, one of the world's most ancient cultures in, in Chinese cultures coming in with this kind of brand new culture that was very hybridic and very international from the start. This is a remarkable piece of complicated iconography. This piece shows the American eagle in a nest, clearly a kind of a white worker with one hand suppressing what appears to be an African-American. And then underneath the nest, held up and seen by his long braid, is a Chinese worker who's being literally crushed by the weight of the eagle's nest, not being allowed into it, but squashed and excluded by it. It was made by the Union Porcelain Works of Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn at that time had a Chinese community of about a thousand people, and the entire nation was reacting to the xenophobic and kind of racist fervor that created the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It telegraphs the ways in which labor was contested, shows the complications, the ugliness, the, and the power then of the United States literally both suppressing immigration and suppressing people. Let's, let's stop here for a moment. I re really love to show you this. An innocent appearing Safeway bag with urging to vote in English 
Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Italian, French, German. And then some wonderful images from San Francisco Chinatown um, from the 1970s urging Chinese Americans to exercise their franchise. For me, this is an incredibly special moment after the cross-ethnic and cross-racial work to pass the Civil Rights Act. Um, to pass the Fair Housing Act, and of course to pass the Voting Acts. The importance of Asian American activism, especially in this case Chinese American activism, is not known enough in terms of really pushing forward voting rights for all. This is the beautiful Marquesa dress worn by Rachel Chu, played by Constance Wu, in the breakthrough film Crazy Rich Asians, which was the first mostly Asian cast film since the Joy Luck Club in 1993. This is very Grecian, very elegant, very classical. Who is that? And of course, imparted a sense of her embrace, I think, of herself, of her own power, of her own dignity. This is one of our most important recent acquisitions. This is the sneak peek. Uh, this has been installed during COVID, and when we open the museum on the 21st of May, visitors for the first time will see this in the museum. Come on in. Um, our wonderful curatorial and registrar staff, thank you, have brought these uh, cranes in. Um, they're now a part of the National Collection, which is uh, such a deep honor. It goes back actually to the previous um, administration when there were several actions taken against immigrant families and children, immigrant children being separated from their families, mm -hmm. um, families being incarcerated. It really struck a nerve in the Japanese American community. There was this a uh, resonance that, that what was happening was very evocative of what had happened during World War II to Japanese American families. So we brought uh, several strings of origami cranes, uh, also known as tsuru, uh, to the Museum of American History. The cranes were made by hundreds, thousands of people across the country. The desire was to actually fold 125,000 cranes and also participate in protests and civil disobedience. Uh -huh. And of course, the other thing that had happened in the interim was the George Floyd murder. So we also decided to pivot uh, with that idea of creating these pseudo in solidarity, not only with immigrant families and children, but also with the black communities. There were no other groups that stood in solidarity with us at the time. And because of that experience, Japanese Americans realized we need to also support other groups when they are being attacked um, because nobody did for us and look at what happened to us. I feel it's particularly important this year and really every year uh, to remember that Asian American history is American history. The richness of the cultures um, who have come to this nation cannot be denied and is a through line. If only we listen, right, and only we hear. And it's an honor to understand and grow uh, with these stories, with these objects, to come together in solidarity through history, through public history, to come together across communities and to knit together the past and the present and the future is what I think really the role of the nation's flagship history museum should be. And it's an honor to do the work. Wow, wow, uh, that's just amazing. So much history that I feel like a lot of us don't even know about. So David, I know that you made this donation. Tell me, why is it so important that, that we do this and, and that people are able to see these tangible objects? So I, I think that um, part of it is that it's telling our story as Asian Americans that um, the Smithsonian, for example, is a place where a lot of non-Asian Americans visit every year and they're able to see uh, the story of, particularly as we've been talking today, how Asian Americans have been in solidarity with other communities, um, particularly around this issue of immigration and then how we also pivoted last year because of the George Floyd killing or murder um, to Black Lives Matters as well. And that as Asian Americans and particularly Japanese Americans, uh, that these are issues that we do want to stand up together. Uh, but uh, these symbols or artifacts are, are very tangible ways for people to make that connection. And, and particularly when you have something like these sudo uh, that, that also have a, a deeper meaning to them um, beyond just mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they are these origami cranes, uh, yeah. that they do represent that hope as well. 
Wow. And, and Sam, I know this is something that's really dear to your heart. You're working on this big project, right? Uh, Nation of Sanctuary. And it, it really takes a look at how refugees have played a role in in our country as far as shaping our country. And I think that's the other thing, you know, we talk about, um, you know, the, the fight for humanity and for civil rights, but also uh, this is important to take a look back at, at the role that we played in actually making the United States what it is today. Right, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have been very integral to the building of American society. Um, they have been, um, uh, they have contributed to the building of infrastructure, railroads, um, agriculture. Um, so, um, you know, the uh, American History Museum can play a very important role in educating and inviting our audiences to um, examine this history in a deeper way through material culture. Theo, why do you think it's so hard for others to see, uh, to see, this struggle. When I talk about others, I'm talking about outside of an Asian community. Mm, that's a great question. I think part of the reason why it's it's difficult for, for people to understand the fullness of Asian America and Pacific Islander life is the fact that, that many of these communities in the Asian American Pacific Islander community um, are dealing with um, decades long, centuries long stereotypes, um, whether of the negative kind or whether you know, it's perceived in, in, in terms of the model minority. And stereotypes themselves are not inherently in, inaccurate, but they what they really represent is just a narrow version of who people really are. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, then you'll never really understand the fullness of their humanity. Um, and that fullness includes any number of characteristics. It could be heroic, but it could also be villainous and everything in between. And if you don't have the ability to see the fullness of Asian American and Pacific Islander life, what you're left with is something that's so narrow, it's just a, a, a small snapshot of, of who we've been and who we could be. So that one of the reasons is, uh, one of the purposes for uh, museums is really to try to educate um, all Americans about the, the broad spectrum of all of these experiences, um, you know, mm -hmm. from, the, from the villainous to the invisible to the heroic and, and everything in between. Yeah, and, and David, it, it, you know, listening to, to all of this, I really, the moment that we, you know, we can safely go back into these mu these museums, you know, with our elders and with everybody, uh, I want to bring my mom by, you know, because I feel like a lot of us um, are battling, the younger generation is battling this generational divide when it comes to, to it. Uh, you know, a lot of our elders are looking at what's happening today and saying, yeah, this is not right. This is not right. They don't like it. But they also see us speaking up and being loud. And some of us, they're telling us, hey, yeah, go ahead, you know, write about it, but don't put your face out there, you know? And there's still this, like, there's still a little hesitancy there, you know? And so uh, do you think that, that that's a real issue here that a lot of Asian American families are dealing with? Uh, and how do we break through that? Well, I think that um, and the Japanese American experience is a perfect example of that. Um, and we had the incarceration experience during World War II. And many of those, uh, the Nisei, the second generation who were incarcerated, did not want to really talk about it after the war. Um, and it was generally their children, actually, who pushed for a reopening of that, that experience and mm -hmm. actually pushed for redress, which was actually accomplished in the 80s. Um, I think that when we talk about sort of generational issues, I, I look at my own children now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think back to when I was their age and experienced a lot of the um, name calling and bullying and things. And it's it's frustrating, I think, for us to see now that our children are, are some 30, 40 years later are experiencing yeah. the exact same things. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this um, um, uprising from our community is now that it's just this enough is enough uh, sense um, that I went through this, there's no reason that my children should be going through this now. Um, so I think yeah. it is that. Um, since the community, I think that things have happened throughout through history, even in nearer history. I, Vincent Chin, for example, which uh, we haven't even mentioned yet, uh, yeah. which really did galvanize us as an Asian American community as well and, and made us recognize that we are the targets of hate um, because of who we are as Asian Americans. When you look at a movement like Black Lives Matter, you know, we saw all facets of of our our 
region and our world come together and they were able to unify. I feel like with the Asian American community, there's just so many different sectors and, you know, we speak all these different languages. And do you think, Sam, you know, because you look at the museum and it has all these different stories from different parts of the world, from, from the Asian community and Pacific Islander community. Do you think that that has been one thing that has held us back? And is it possibly the reason why um, some would say we're, we're almost light years behind uh, compared to other civil rights movements? Yeah, I would think that the that the diversity of Asian American Pacific Islanders has always been there, and I think that diversity that diversity is going to continue to grow, um, and that it's that's actually one of the strengths. I don't think there's a singular and monolithic Asian American identity or community, mm -hmm. but the fact that we come from so many different linguistic, geographical, ethnic. Uh, uh, backgrounds um, really helps to strengthen our the the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander presence in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I love it. I know. I feel like it, it's just different this time around, and um, and I don't know if it's just because of everything that's happened, and also just the, the you know, just how just crazy things have gotten you know, and out of control things have gotten. Um, I feel like we haven't seen something like this in our time, um, you know, when it comes to our community and, and what's happening to it. I mean, our people, they're scared. You know, I hear this all the time. You know, my, my father's scared to leave my mom, you know, in the car, you know, by herself when he goes into the store. Uh, it's it, it's a different it's a different time. Uh, I do want to ask, um, maybe Theo, you can talk a little bit about lasting solutions. There's no way that we know we can't eradicate racism. You know, there's always going to be some remnants of it. There's, it's always going to exist in a way. But, uh, but as far as finding lasting solutions to this problem and minimizing it and, and getting the word out, where do we start? I think one is to um, think about the importance of our educational and cultural institutions like museums, colleges and universities and others that can help us tell a more nuanced um, and more thoroughly involved and, and, and fully researched understanding of the, the fullness of the humanity of all of these groups. And I think once we realize uh, those kinds of histories, we'll find that we've actually been involved in each other's worlds, in each other's lives, uh, in our workplaces, um, migration patterns and places of settlement and worship. Um, and, and we'll find greater senses of commonality that actually run much deeper than what we've been told. And, and we're gonna be connecting not just with each other as ethnic groups, but also with really the entire uh, American society to, to understand these common roots, these common experiences that are at the heart of American experiences. Yeah, so David, your thoughts are on this. Yeah, I think uh, I, to echo what Theo just said, I, education really is the key. Um, and certainly we need some short term solutions to address the immediate um, uh, violence and incidents against Asian Americans. And um, I, part of that is changing the norms that we have in the society, that it's, it's understanding that Asian Americans are a normal part of American society. Um, and that will happen through education. That's why JCL, a, a big part of our mission is to educate people about the Japanese American experience. It's why we work so much with institutions like the Smithsonian, because mm -hmm. um, it is working together to reach as broad a population as possible with those messages. And if I can mention legislatively right now, yeah. there is the Japanese American Confinement Education Act, which will actually create a $10 million fund to promote education about the Japanese American experience. There is mm -hmm. also a bill that Grace Meng has um, uh, introduced uh, for Asian American education. So there is a need to increase um, both in the schools, in universities, um, I, everywhere. And it's also in the media too, I, uh, whether it's media, um, television shows, movies, um, all this is a part of normalizing Asian Americans as a part of American culture, because a lot of this is because of that xenophobia that has persisted throughout our, our history. Mm -hmm. uh, going back to why, why Tsudu for Solidarity um, made all those cranes, it was to be in solidarity with immigrants because Asian Americans are so often the targets of xenophobia, even if we have been here for four or five generations. Yeah, yeah. And Sam, um, you know, as we we wrap things up with you, uh, for those who have not had the museum experience, uh, 
tell me a little bit about about how it changes perspective, it changes minds, really uh, what it embodies um, and, and why it is so crucial. And then on top of that, if we're unable to get, because not everybody lives in Washington, you know, we're, we're lucky because we've got this gem in our backyard, right? Uh, but are there other ways that, that they can connect with these stories? Certainly. So the American History Museum and museums in general um, are important ways and, and often the first ways that people encounter histories. Um, so they, you know, if they're lucky enough like us to have a museum in the backyard, they would go and learn about the material culture and find some way to connect to these histories. Um, but if they don't have the privilege to come out to a museum, they can um, go online to a, a, to online resources, uh, which the Smithsonian Institution has created. Um, and discover new programs, new digital ex exhibitions, oral histories and archives online um, to learn about this, these histories. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome to have these resources out there. Now we just got to have people out there taking advantage of them. So uh, Sam, Theo, David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for all that you do and for joining us today. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, Thank you Angie. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Congresswoman and Smithsonian Regent, Doris Matsui. Hi everyone. It is wonderful to be with you for this important discussion as we look into our past, confront the present and explore the possibilities of the future. Listening to the many unique voices of the Asian American community. I'm proud to be a Smithsonian Regent and board member of the National Museum of American History and the Asian Pacific American Center. In our work, we strive to tell the story of the American experience in its entirety, always determined to uncover the unvarnished truth and make sure we work towards understanding our complicated history. As we continue through AAPI History Month, we have a platform to highlight the many unique stories across the AAPI community. During this month, we can listen to each other's stories and make a concerted effort to understand the many nuances of this amazing tapestry of cultures, especially as we continue to see a rise in AAPI hate and discrimination. We must be very intentional about how we lead this discussion, how we listen, and how we can ensure dignity and respect throughout our communities. It has been wonderful to see the cohesion amongst Asian Americans and all Americans really in the fight against racism. But it is important that we also understand that the AAPI community is a diverse group of people coming from many different ethnic backgrounds, languages, and traditions. I have lived the quintessential American story. I grew up on a farm in Central California went to UC Berkeley and got a great public education. And I've had, had the privilege to work in public service in the White House and now in Congress. Yet I was born in an internment camp. I'm one generation removed from the dark chapter on our country's history. For a lot of us, where we start out is most definitely not where we end up. And that is the essence of the Asian American, but also American story how we got here, our families and our dreams. These are the stories that we must lift up to ensure a better future. I want to thank all of my friends at the Smithsonian for holding this important discussion. And to everyone watching, please go check out smithsonianapa.org slash stand, where you can find thousands of references from across the Smithsonian for learning more about Asian American history. Thank you all for being a part of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Matsui, for those beautiful and poignant comments and for all you do for all of us and especially those in the Asian American community. It's now my pleasure to introduce and moderate a conversation with three remarkable activists from across the nation. Bing Chen, president of Gold House. Karen Gill, executive director of SALDEF, the Sikh American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and Tiffany Chang, Director of Engagement, of Community Engagement, the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, the AAJC. Thank you all so much 
uh, for, for being with us today and for taking part. I'm gonna start with one question. Um, maybe Bing, if I may start with you, share with me what are some of the uh, immediate issues that the broader AAPI community have been mobilizing around. Of course, we know about the hate crime legislations and voting rights or COVID recovery for small businesses. Um, what have you been working on? We're focused on three areas collectively with great partners like Tiffany and Kieran. I think first is reshaping public opinion about our diaspora so that we're not seen as mm -hmm. perpetual foreigners, all model minorities as it were, or that we are complicit in the creation of this disease known as COVID-19. Uh, yeah. We're course, collaborating with media companies and so forth to ensure this. Uh, second is, as we know, not to make this oppression Olympics, but API owned small businesses, particularly those run by API women, are actually the hardest hit during the pandemic. And this is for a slate of different systemic biases. And so how can we be complicit in elevating the floor from Main Street all the way to the next great unicorn companies founded by our community? And then the final piece is, despite you know, great record numbers and incredible work from organizations like API Vote, too many APIs are still the least likely to vote. And if we don't vote and ensure that we're politically engaged and represented, we can ensure broader societal representation. Great, thank you. And, and that kind of work, as you know, has been going on for so long, but really actively, especially since the 1960s. We have this wonderful set of objects in our collection that's a Safeway bag from the 1970s paper bag that has get out to vote in eight languages, including Japanese, uh, Chinese, Korean, I think, and Tagalog. So this, this advocacy, as you know, has, has a rich history. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for doing that work. Um, Tiffany, talk with me a, a bit about how allies can best help and, and support the work uh, that you're doing. Absolutely. So I, I work with 250 community partners across the country are doing all sorts of uh, things to respond to this moment. Uh, some things that they've been doing for, for many years now, whether that's providing mental health care services, uh, whether it's um, doing domestic violence prevention work, uh, victim assistance, or just creating pieces of art and um, working with culture, cultural workers um, to, to provide a space for folks to process what's happening. Um, and so I'm seeing the great work that's being done across the country. Uh, and we are doing um, our best to support that work and uplift it at this time. And another thing that AAJC is doing right now is collecting and documenting stories of anti-Asian hate. Uh, so our platform, Stand Against Hatred, um, is available in five different languages, Asian languages. And uh, we're also hosting with uh, uh, our organizational partner, Hollaback, on bystander intervention training. So that's one really great way for allies to get involved is to learn the skills necessary to actually um, be that person that steps in when they see somebody being harassed. So in, all sorts of actions are, are being hosted across the country, initiatives that, um, that pop up in, in, in neighborhoods, uh, whether that's mutual aid or accompanying seniors to the grocery store. Our community is really resilient and uh, you know, history has, has taught us that time and time again, but certainly that is not, um, that's it, th this current moment has not been an exception to that. Um, thank you so much. And thank you uh, for all the work that you do. Um, Karen, uh, picking up on history and thinking of history and learning history is so critical to breaking down barriers uh, between us all. Karen, share with us kind of what what's happening um, uh, from your lens today and the work that, that you're doing. The Sikh American community certainly is, is no stranger to hate and violence. And in a, in a way, in this moment, we're a community that actually has a lot of knowledge and experience, um, unfortunately dealing with, with what we're seeing, a lot of the xenophobia and that manifesting into hate crimes and violence. Um, the Sikh American community post 9-11 specifically saw an uptick in, in hate crimes. Um, and Saldiv has done actually a lot of research um, in the past uh, couple of years. In 2012, we did a survey in, in conjunction with Stanford University on the public perception of Sikh Americans. 60% uh, of uh, the broader American public didn't know who Sikh Americans were and had a sort of negative associations with our articles of faith. Um, last year, we launched the National Sikh American Survey, um, sort of outlining um, the Sikh American experience and 58% of Sikh Americans indicated that they had um, experienced discrimination. Both Tiffany and Bing, I think, 
did a great job of sort of outlining some things that, that we can work on together. Um, Sick Americans have been in this country for, you know, over a century coming here actually in the late 1800s. So we have a long history uh, here in this country, but a lot of times our, our stories are not told, they're not centered. Um, and in some ways we're invisible despite really being part of the American story and the fabric of this, you know, of this nation and building this nation really. Um, and I always tell this story, I actually was a volunteer for Solvit before I came on board as executive director. And I gave trainings, uh, whether it was with schools, I give trainings to, to FBI, I gave, gave trainings to law enforcement across the board. And one of the first questions we would ask as part of the training is, what do you think of when you see a man with a turban? And we would get all sorts of answers. A lot of them were negative, right? You know, the, the association, the incorrect association with terrorism, um, you know, the in, incorrect association with a turban being something that's dangerous or foreign. Um, when Attorney General Graywall uh, took the position in New Jersey, um, which is where I, where I was from before I came to DC, it was at that point, the large majority of the responses that I got when I gave the training started to change because they were able to see somebody in a role, in a sort of a very public role um, and associate have those associations, make those associations with our articles of faith and how somebody looks, uh, whether they're not sort of the typical, you know, they don't have the typical look of, of what somebody would think of in that position. That made a huge difference. Certainly representation is something that I think is really important. All right, thank you so much, Karen. And we're gonna take a quick break and come back to this conversation as it's truly a pleasure to bring up Safan Kim and Ronnie Chang for a special conversation. And we'll be back to this one after that. Thanks for joining us. My name is Sefan Kim. I'm a reporter here in WABC TV in New York. Um, I'm joined by actor comedian Ronnie Chang, who, as we all know, has been very outspoken on this issue for many years. So really lucky to have Ronnie with us. Taking this sort of a step back from how this is really impacting the Asian American community, how do you see this from a broader perspective? Wow, straight for the difficult questions, man. The broader <laughs> perspective. I mean, it. I feel like I'm applying for college here. How do you, how do you, let's let's fix racism in five minutes. <laughs> um, you know, we, we want this master equation that we plug everything into and it gives us the answer and it fixes all our problems. But I think that is kind of where we all get hung up a bit. You know, uh, taking a macro view. I, I I advocate for taking a micro view of it and that, that this is not to avoid answering your question it's just that you're right there's so many factors it's so broad that you know race society social economic factors factor into it that i personally try to take it um uh, all the news stories kind of one at a time you know and, and try to process it that way and how do we help people it feels different in the sense that it feels like this is some lasting change which is very hard to come by in america um, and it's taking everyone's effort to kind of push it forward. It, Asian Americans have never been really, I would say, truly, truly united on many things uh, be because we're not a monolith. Uh, you've grown up here, so please correct me if I'm wrong. This is just my yes. outsider speculation. Um, so Asian Americans have never been tr really united on, on many things, much less race and how Asian Americans should relate to American society, the rest of American society. I don't think we could be here having this conversation without that, that movement in the summertime that, that laid down the groundwork, meaning that was the first time I think we can arguably say that cross-racially, black, brown, white, yellow, but particularly with the Asian American community, we saw the community march and stand side by side. This might be the first time where we have hit a sort of a racial crisis that it envelops all of Asian Americans. You know, if there is a silver lining to all this, um, maybe that's one of the silver linings that we come out saying, you know, all of these sort of divisions and fractions, even within, we need to learn to really work together. Let me ask you a question though. Yeah. So you've been, you've been like very passionate about this. I, I wonder like from a personal level, this must be visceral. You see these stories, you see these attacks. I mean, take me through like gutturally, what, what's your reaction when you see some of this? My first reaction is that like, just like, like fear. There's this idea of um, America's very chaotic. You know, it's very chaotic compared to 
back home is uh, America is a very chaotic place. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we all come here for, uh, you know, I, I'm lucky I came here because I, I have, I had options. You, you do have this unique perspective. You're sort of a global citizen, right? You live in many places yeah. outside of America and America for extended periods of time. As a, as a non-American, you, you use the word chaotic. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that. I mean, this is not an American problem, right? Um, hate, it's a human problem, right? But I'm curious what that's like, frame it for me in, in other cultures and in countries that you've spent time in versus what you're seeing the problem here. Is it different or is it not? Anyway, I'm working on this bit about how we keep comparing, like the problem with racism is that we keep comparing the, 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 um, the, the best people in one race to the worst people of another race. And we just need to compare the worst people of all races because uh, they're everywhere. And, and that's um, actually very insightful. Uh, I can tell you that every country I've been to, it, it, those people are bad. Um, right. So, I mean, uh, man, I, one, one big difference, I will say that it's a very hopeful difference is that in America, I think there is a lot of, um, freedom to tell these stories. There's a lot of freedom in the press, like yourself, people like yourselves, to report on these stories, to get eyewitness accounts. There's a lot of, there's a lot of impetus in America. It's such a, I mean, just numerically, it's a very big country, you know, 300 million people. So there's, there's, you can easily kind of get momentum behind stories. And, and uh, for anyone out there who's still listening, who made it, who made it to the end of this, um, the hopeful note is that, look, America is very chaotic, but there are more good people here. And also there's lots of organizations and there are leaders who are there. But they, are, they are providing legal help. There's some people who will escort your elderly relatives to where they need to go. There's, um, there's assembly men and women who, are, who care and who are there. You, and if you find them, if you find them, you will be inspired by these leaders too, who are actually there to uh, provide help to the community. Ladies and gentlemen, Ronnie Chang, thank you all for joining us. I hope you guys really took something out of this conversation. Continue it soon. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you so much, Sifan and Ronnie, for that incredible conversation. Let's bring us back. Bing, I would love to go back to you, please, because you've been one of the standard bearers of keeping so many stories alive uh, in the AAPI community. Uh, reflect with me kind of on, on that journey um, coming up to this point and, and maybe uh, what's next. Uh, absolutely, uh, Anthea. Um, I think about this in two ways as my mother would approach it. Uh, one is adversity may have brought us together and this adversity of course is historic high crimes against our community, but it's really affirmation that will keep us here. It is affirmative yeah. portrayals as Kieran is alluding to that de-emasculize Asian men that empower Asian women, Asian Pacific Islander women. Uh, second, it is economic and sustained economic growth. And third, it's greater political advocacy. And I think what you're seeing is not us just uh, holistically approaching you know, all these issues, but also unifying the API diaspora with other multicultural communities for collective gain. Let's not forget, and Tiffany and Kira know this better than anyone, but in the 1960s, it's because of black leaders that our community and people who look and candidly sound like us, can now interracially marry, vote, have improved immigration rates and so forth. And so while our community and our origins of our challenges may be disparate from say the black community, the ways that we'll solve all these things are highly concentric. And I think we need to start moving to that shift. Uh, moreover, as we know, the numbers are on our side. Not only are we the fastest growing immigrant population and the fastest growing, we already punch well above our weight in so many different industries. And we're also being complicit through mixed race births and otherwise in other communities growth. And so something that a lot of us are working on that Tiffany should share more about is given we're focusing on this holistic approach of representation, economic development, as well as political advocacy, given our desire for the API community, not just to build foreign bias, but be complicit in multicultural growth, is there a moment or a movement where we can all come together? And I think Tiffany should share a little bit more about what we're thinking there. Um, absolutely. So I think like the past year, there's been this kind of buildup of energy and motivation to do something uh, do something big with the community across communities. And you know when I think about the future, right and for this, for so long for the past year it's been really difficult to think about the future because well it, it so much depends on like when we're reopening, when we can get vaccinated, et cetera. But 
studies have actually shown that thinking about the future is an act uh, can be an act of resilience and mm -hmm. um, allows us to to be able to move forward confidently um, and in a healthy way. Uh, we're coming up against uh, against the um, first anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. Asian Americans were at those marches, um, feeling very activated, some for the first time about um, the movement for Black Lives, and similarly, you know, uh, when a couple months ago, when the Atlanta shootings happened, our Black allies, our Latinx allies, um, all came out um, to support and express solidarity with our communities. Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is this upcoming, an upcoming mobilization that would seek to bring folks together on a large scale um, to, to commit to that solidarity and those everyday acts of rehumanizing and helping one another that is really like our only hope from breaking out of these cycles of violence that our communities have been dealing with for so long. The public announcement, official announcement is coming. Um, okay, but what I can say is that this is the first time we've spoken to, um, to a major uh, outlet um, about this upcoming mobilization. And we are bringing in folks and already have partners from across the, across communities of color, the LGBTQ community um, and the women's rights movement. Um, this action is timed to coincide with um, the 39th anniversary of the murder of Vincent Chin in Detroit in 1982. Right. And so we thought that it would be appropriate, um, not only because of that, but because it's Immigrant Heritage Month. So this action is going to take place in Washington. Uh, and while the exact location is still to be announced, um, we're hoping for it to be an occasion for folks to come together and celebrate our diversity and resilience. And I think with the Asian American community, there's just a real sense of determination now to say, this is not, we're not moving forward in the same way. We are here, we belong, we, we demand the same, you know, to be treated with dignity and respect, and we demand rights, and we demand that for our communities, but for all communities that are experiencing these things. And I think that is so important. And that's why we're all coming together in solidarity uh, around this march, around this event. Um, and and to, to say that, to say those things and to be seen here in the nation's capital. Thanks to advocates uh, uh, like yourselves, uh, to expand the lens of liberty uh, and justice for all. So uh, Bing, Kieran, and Tiffany, I can't thank you enough for joining us today as we continue to explore uh, the past, present, and thanks to you all, the future of Asians and American and Asians um, as uh, forming and creating uh, our history anew. And so I'm so grateful uh, to all of you. It's now a distinct pleasure to introduce the Smithsonian's 14th secretary, Lonnie G. Bunch III, the first historian, the first African-American to lead the Smithsonian. Lonnie, of course, is the founding director of the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, and we count him as a dear friend. Thank you for joining us for these thought-provoking conversations with our esteemed group of panelists and presenters. My heartfelt thanks to the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center, the National Museum of American History, and our friends at AARP. It was a fitting way to celebrate this month recognizing Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Let me also take this moment to say clearly, the Smithsonian denounces those who traffic in hate. The increasing incidents of bigotry and violence aimed at the AAPI community are unacceptable. They debase our democratic ideals and devalue our shared humanity. We are proud to stand with our Asian American brothers and sisters now and into the future. From the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 that effectively ended Chinese immigration to decades of incarceration of innocent Japanese American citizens on US soil during World War II, the unfarnished truth about our history is often hard to hear, but it is also the best way to understand and to heal. The Smithsonian is committed to using our platform to bring people together to discuss important issues that affect us all. We believe that knowledge is the best antidote to ignorance and fear. 
It is why the Asian Pacific American Center built the Standing Together Against Hate website that helps deconstruct systematic oppression and why they collected over 260 different resources for teachers and the public to elevate AAPI voices and address stereotypes and bias. Thanks to them and to all of you for highlighting the resilience of Asian American, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and for helping open the page of an important chapter in the American narrative. We hope to have the same type of impact with our Smithsonian institution-wide, our shared future, reckoning with our racial past. Using resources from across the Smithsonian and collecting with other organizations around the country in innovative ways, it'll be our first coordinated effort to explicitly address how race and racism affect us all. By sharing these stories and experiences of all peoples integral to the foundation and character of our country, we help, we believe we can make the country better. So thank you for your commitment to fairness and commitment to America. America, they get back to dollars, they don't carry ya. 7,000 miles away from home with language barriers. Land of opportunity, tell me, is it good to you? But six feet deep, us all the land is where they bury in November 1991. Papa came here with the wife, two daughters, the money, but they wanted them a better life. Peace to their name, so they piecing up the pain. Ain't no peace in the position, it's an immigrant that's praying. For a piece of the Americana pie, for the king. To a piece of dream, they sold you, but it only was a dream. For a piece of mind to thinking that my mama could as an equal, not a foreign immigrant or in between. I was a kid in the sky, nothing but dreams in her eyes, hoping that we would survive. But mama, those were the times they telling us compromise. They always feed in the slice, made to believe I don't exist unless I wear a disguise. Cause I've been constantly lied to broken down till I cry. Till I no longer recognize the person that was inside. Until we fade like the sun, and we forget where we're from. Though we still hate till it's done, and never question it once. So mama, tell me we want the person that I become. I have a soul for a tongue and the skin that shines. And listen to me because the place that I'm from is still lingers deep on my tongue. So every word from my lips can hold the weight of a ton if I'm ever stepping. I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm sinking, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm slipping, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. And even when I'm sinking, I'm never looking down. I do this for myself to the end to hold it down. Yeah.